Hello YouTube, this is Angela Red. So I thought I'd do a video talking about Confucius, the analytics. Confucius was a Eastern uh, 550 BC um, Chinese, I wouldn't call him a philosopher, but uh, at least a wise man or a sage. Certainly was very influential in the politics of the day. A lot of, uh, a few disciples and um, some of his works of course have survived, including the analytics and his other works too by Confucius. But I've been through this. It's not very long. This one by Dover. They got really good paperbacks here. You see at the top there. And um, I've got a few marks in here that I want to share, just in case or you don't get around to reading it. So I should mention as an introduction to this video that Confucius wrote very much about the politics of his age. This book, The Analytics, is not very long. I would say about two-thirds of it is not that interesting. About a third of it is pretty much politics of the day and the different names of people and so not very interesting to the to like a Western person probably. Um, a third of it is are kind of sort of interesting little phrases and then a third of it are, are good quotes. So I'm gonna quote from this and I'm gonna tell you what the book is because there's multiple books inside of this. And just in case you get it, and then you can follow along where I read the certain passage. And I'm also standing up this time rather than sitting down, just so I can move about. And and I do have another sweatshirt. I just, for some reason, this one happens to be the one in, in, in the other videos as well that I'm wearing at the time. So this is from book one. Book one is called Concerning Fundamental Principles. And this is chapter four. The chapters are only like a paragraph each. Um, so this one says here, um, I daily examine myself on three points. In planning for others have I failed in conscientiousness. In intercourse with friends have I been insincere. And have I failed to practice what I have been taught. I thought that was good. Okay, now chapter 8. The Master said, and you'll, I'll be saying that often, a lot of the, the paragraphs start with the master said, which was Confucius. This was his disciples writing these things down. And of course, he was the master. So the master said, a scholar who is not grave, which means serious, a scholar who is not serious will not inspire respect. And his learning will therefore lack stability. His chief principles would should be conscientiousness and sincerity. Let him have no friends unequal to himself. And when in the wrong, let him not hesitate to amend. Fairly common sense there. That was pretty good, though. And also a good way of putting it. Sometimes you there's a you have like a, a bit of knowledge, some kind of nice phrase, but you'd like it to be written in in, in a nice uh, nice way, or in an economic way. The the less words, the better. And like a almost a poetic. Uh, method. Okay, this is book two. Book two concerning government. Chapter 11. The master said, he who keeps on reviewing his old and acquiring new knowledge may become a teacher of others. So that's his definition of a teacher. Not only do you have to learn about the past and review what you already know, but you but this is the most important part. You have to keep learning. In a sense, a teacher is supposed to be a professional student, someone who continues to learn. That is a teacher. Um, chapter 15, the master said, learning without thinking is useless. Thinking without learning is dangerous. I think that's a pretty good one. Um, learning without thinking is useless. So you have to be able to use this knowledge. Knowledge is not necessarily an end in itself. It has to be used for something. And thinking without learning is dangerous, probably because you'd be, um, you wouldn't have any content to back your ideas. You'd just be starting out with some kind of prejudice or ideology, and you wouldn't have any facts to back them up. Any, any um, events from history, uh, things like that, or science or whatever it might be. Okay, chapter 17. The master said, "Shall I teach you the meaning of knowledge? When you know a thing, to recognize that you know it." And when you do not, to know that you do not know, 
that is knowledge. So that and what's interesting is that's very much that's very close to Socrates's. Um, the only thing he knows is ignorance. That quote, whatever that is, very close to that. And yet, there's really no connection between them, Confucius and Socrates. So it's interesting how they both came up with that independently. Okay, that's it for book two. And let me just see if I have anything down for book three. Nope. Okay, book oh book four I have stuff. Okay, book four concerning virtue. Chapter three, the master said, only the virtuous are competent to love or hate men. I thought that was very interesting, and to me that meant that only the virtuous could judge whether a person was good or or bad or virtuous or or full of vice so to speak only the virtuous although that begs the question then is virtue then self-appointed how do we know a person is virtuous then so but i think it's an interesting thought though that only the virtuous are the ones that can judge if someone is virtuous or not okay chapter 10 the master said the wise man in his attitude toward the world has neither predilections nor prejudices. He is on the side of what is right. I think that's an amazing statement, especially for today. Um, in many cases, especially in the academic world, people are, I want to say, bought and paid for, but they're very much biased in their worldviews on the kinds of things that they're trying to promote. They're not necessarily on the side of what is right or true, they are pushing their agendas, whatever that might be. So I think that is, it's a degradation of, of uh, I want to say the learned world, something like that, I'm not sure. But consider that academics and universities are really a, a recent phenomenon, at least being public ownership of them. Uh, schools of, of learning and high learning used to be all private. And they used to be started by scholars, and then people would come and hear them hear them speak, and that's how it used to be. And now it's government funding, and and at what in what ways does that funding um, influence the kind of research that goes on? But it's especially prevalent, I think, in the humanities, not necessarily the science. Okay, this is book six. Book six concerning certain disciples and other subjects. Okay, chapter. 16. When nature exceeds training, you have the rustic. When training exceeds nature, you have the clerk. It is only when nature and training are proportionately blended that you have the higher type of man. So that's pretty good if you take nature to be experience. So he says, when, nat when experience exceeds training, you have the rustic. Someone who learns out in the wild, um, doesn't have the benefits of, of Meant being mentored by an expert, so someone who learns what they can on the job, but may have missed, may have uh, great blind spots. When training exceeds nature, you have the clerk, someone who is, a, you maybe call them a textbook, textbook learned, um, they don't have the experience yet, so they're very much uh, um, a greenhorn, as, as they call it, someone who's, who's waiting, but at least ready for the experience. And so he says that the blend is the best thing, and that's, of course, prevalent to teacher ed too. Teachers are learning the job, but they also need to be ready to do that. It's a, if there's a mix, it's always better. So, Okay, chapter 18. He who knows the truth is not equal to him who loves it, and he who loves it is not equal to him who delights in it. Um, take what you will from that. I'm not sure exactly what he means by that. Uh, okay, chapter 19. The master said, To men above the average, one may discourse on higher things. But to those who are below the average, one may not discourse on higher things. Um, it's certainly politically incorrect today. Um, I don't know exactly what Confucius was saying in terms of whether the, um, what do you call it, the below average, the below average, in I guess in competency, they cannot... They cannot learn about higher things. It's a waste of time to teach them. Or was he saying that it is dangerous to teach them these things? I don't know. Okay, chapter 20. Um, 
Okay, when Fan Chi, which is some guy, I guess, asked what constituted wisdom, the master replied, to devote oneself earnestly to one's duty to humanity, and, and while respecting the spirits of the departed, to avoid them may be called wisdom. On his asking about virtue, the master replied, the man of virtue puts, puts duty first, however difficult, and makes what he will gain thereby an after consideration, and this may be called virtue. For those who have studied a little bit of philosophy, that is Kantian ethics right there, duty bound. Duty first, you do it because you must, and then if there's any benefit later on, it's a bonus. But you're never to pursue an end because you are going to gain something from it or some kind of selfish end. Never. That's what Confucius um, states here. And this, to me, is, is straight up uh, Kant, so Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher. Okay, uh, chapter 25. The master said, The scholar who becomes widely versed in letters and who restrains his learning within the bounds of good conduct is not likely to leave the track. Now, it's interesting here is he doesn't seem to put any judgment on that. He's not saying that it's good or bad to leave the track. It might be good to, to stay on the track, to not be persecuted, or if you're, because he says you're the bounds, one should remain in the bounds of good conduct i.e. staying within the law and um, all of that. But maybe it's, as history has shown, and Confucius wouldn't have known the kind of history that we know, um, many of the great uh, progress, movements of progress, have come from, and perhaps solely, come from people bending those bounds. You've got Galileo, for example. That's the easiest example. All the Enlightenment movement, all of that, um, all kinds of stuff that, church used to persecute, and then the state used to persecute, the kings, the monarchies. Creation of the United States, of course, required a lot of bending of the rules. It started a war. So, but I don't know. It, Confucius doesn't seem to judge that. Okay, this is uh, chapter uh, 28. This is the last one in book um, 6. Okay, this is a bit of a long one, but I think it's actually interesting. So, um, this guy's name is Zhu Kung said, Suppose there were one who conferred benefits far and wide upon the people, and who was able to succour the multitude. What might one say to him? Could he be, be called a philanthropist? So a person who gives charity. What has, he do, uh, what, what has he to do with philanthropy? said the master. Must he not be a sage? Even you and Shun, the two people. Uh, felt their deficiency herein. For the philanthropist is one who, desiring to maintain himself, sustains others, and desiring to develop himself, develops others. To be able from one's own self to draw a parallel for the treatment of others, that may be called the rule of philanthropy. And to me, that, that speaks of what capitalism is. And it seems to contradict what he said earlier about um, do one's duty first, and then if some, if some benefit comes later, good for you. But you're never to pursue something because it's going to benefit you. And yet he talks about philanthropy, and he says, um, one who is desiring to ma maintain himself sustains others as a side effect, and desiring to develop himself develops others as a side effect. Well, <laughs> he seems to be, uh, it seems to be contrary views here. So, okay, next, next will be book seven, concerning the master himself. So this is chapter seven. The master said, from him who has brought his simple present of dried flesh, seeking to enter my school, I have never withheld instruction. Now, it's fairly common for teachers to accept gifts they even consider, like, people used to bring apples to their teachers. That was, like, some thing, some day, uh, one day, I guess. Um, but to me, I think it might be a little, there may be more meaning here. I think he might be trying to say that a person who is serious about their education and serious enough that they're willing to s spend money or to bring a gift to the teacher, these are the ones that I teach, the ones that are ready to go. 
that they have that they either have they they're bringing a gift or even if they were not wealthy that they have done some works at another time at an earlier time and then they have brought part of that labor with them to the instructor to then be taught i think that might be more i think that that's what i get from that sentence or that paragraph i'm not sure if that was necessarily what confucius was saying but that's what i get from it okay chapter 8 the master said I expound nothing to him who is not earnest, nor help out anyone not anxious to express himself. When I have demonstrated one angle, and he cannot bring me back to the other three, then I do not repeat my lesson. And I wrote here, um, student must show interest in learning. I guess that was sort of similar to the, the previous one. Okay, I think that's similar enough to the previous one. Okay, next one is chapter 11. The master said, If wealth were a thing one could count on finding, even though it meant my becoming a whip-holding groom, I would do it. As one cannot count on finding it, I will follow the quests that I love better. And I wrote here, Oh yeah, I'm not really sure what this one meant. Um, I got here, is it about preference to pursue one's interests? Yeah, I'm, I'll leave that up to to you guys. I'm not really sure what to make it because he says wealth. If I cannot count on finding wealth, I don't know what he might mean by wealth. If he means money or if he means something else. I'm not really sure what that means because he also mentions, like he says here, if he can find it, then he would do it. But since he can't, he can't be He's not uh, guaranteed in, in finding it. Then he'll do something else that he more enjoys. I don't really understand what he's trying to say. That doesn't make sense to me. The master said, this is uh, chapter 15. The master said, with coarse food to eat, water for drink, and a bent arm for a pillow, even in such a state I could be happy, for wealth and honor obtained unworthily are to me as a fleeting cloud. What does he mean by fleeting cloud? I guess something that would just come and go, maybe? Fleeting cloud? Cloud up there today and then tomorrow is gone? Um, so I guess as long as he is, like, food to eat, coarse food to eat? I'm not sure if what he means by coarse food. Um, if he means, like, this, the barest necessities, or I don't know what he means by coarse food. Water for drink and a bent arm for a pillow. So he's saying, like, as long as I have, like, the, the, a bent arm for a pillow is, is what he already has, a bent arm. Um, food and water, of course, are necessary. So it sounds like he's saying, as long as I have, like, the bare necessities of survival, um, I don't care about wealth and honor because they are, they, they come and go or something. I don't know. I don't know. It's not. All right. We're on to book eight. Book eight, chapter seven. So, Song Zhu, some guy, said, The scholar must not be without capacity and fortitude, for his load is heavy and the road is long. He takes virtue for his load, and is he not that heavy? Only with death does his course end, and is not that long? I thought that was good. That was an interesting paragraph. Um... I guess it's sort of a little bit self, um, not embellishing, but he talked about the scholar, and of course all these guys are scholars. So. Okay, chapter 9. The master said, The people may be made to follow a course, but not to understand the reason why. Interesting. Um, I guess it might speak to government. Consider, like, um, secret police and all those documents that sometimes you see on the news where they've got like the black marker that are erasing things that the public can't know. Um, maybe it's a little bit of that. Um, and consider the times. The populace in ancient China, as well as most of everywhere else, were not, they, they couldn't read. Um, they were not, um, certainly not educated. So, they very much could be whipped up into mobs, especially in China. Uh, a lot of rebellions and stuff over there. Um, so I don't know if that was kind of protection. 
it was just like a um, because of the circumstances we really just have to the, the people just have to trust the dear leaders I don't know it certainly doesn't fly these days with liberty and all that going on okay chapter 12 the master said is it not easy to find a man who has studied for three years without aiming at pay money getting getting paid for it um, I think but I, I guess I'm it, it's how it's worded is important here because he says some uh, is not is it not easy to find a man who has studied for three years without aiming at pay meaning someone who is who is studying because he's being paid someone who is who is paid to study something not free inquiry and he's saying is it not easy so he's saying that the people that do that are are common okay chapter 13 the master said the man of unwavering sincerity and love of moral discipline will keep to the death his excellent principles he will not enter a tottering state nor dwell in a rebellious one when law and order prevail in the empire he is in evidence when it is not without when it is without law and order he withdraws when law and order prevail in his state he is ashamed to be needy and of no account when law and order fail he is ashamed to be in affluence, to be in affluence and honor. So I thought that was interesting. It almost as if the person reflects the culture, and if the culture isn't what it's supposed to be, or if it isn't dignifying, then the person withdraws. And when it is, then the person um, can feel confidence in their culture. But also at the end there, when it says here, if law and order fail, he is ashamed if in affluence and honor. That would suggest that he should be ashamed because he perhaps made the state into he he made the state he made the law and order of the state fail. If he is an affluence when these things are going on, then he should be ashamed of himself. That kind of stuff because he maybe had ownership in it. Okay, here is one more uh, for book uh, eight, chapter seventeen. The master said, "Learn as if you are not reaching your goal." And as though you were afraid of missing it and so I don't really know what that means it, it sounds like it's a good one though um, I thought first that learn as if you're not reaching your goal um, what does that mean does that mean that you should not necessarily learn to, towards the goal that you can try to read in and out of the discipline maybe read stuff that is sort of related and then maybe that's a better way of doing it or maybe it's like a confidence thing learn as if you are not reaching your goal as if you you should be frustrated you should make make yourself frustrated toward the goal and then he says here at the end and as though you were afraid of missing it I don't know how you put those two things together um, maybe it has to do with something about paying attention toward the goal when you're reading and I don't know Okay, let's see. Book. Uh, well, let me see. What this is. Oh, yeah. Okay, book uh, nine, chiefly personal. Uh, chapter seventeen, the master said, "I have never yet seen a man whose love of virtue equaled his love of woman." So it seems like he's saying is that the natural, the instinctual tendencies, such as love of woman. I don't think he's necessarily being literal. He could be being literal, but I think including, he's just saying the appetite. So being hungry or being vengeful, or warring, uh, getting angry, um, having urge, sexual urges. These are all natural things. These things are easier to come by in, in men and all people um, than finding men who love virtue. I think that's what he's trying to say. And virtue, of course, does not necessarily come instinctually. It certainly comes with a lot of reflection and thought about life, about what one should do, and those are not necessarily. Um, they may they may be against your instincts. You may have to to block those things, or at least keep them in check. Okay, chapter twenty three. The master said, "Can anyone refuse assent to words of just admonish?" 
but it, but it is amendment that is of value. Can anyone be otherwise than pleased with advice persuasively offered? But it is the application that is of value. Mere interest without application, mere assent without amendment, I can do nothing whatever with men of such caliber. So, this is a simple meaning. It's just the, the practical, practical use of things is what I think that means. Okay, chapter 29. The master said, There are some with whom one can associate in study, but who are not yet able to make common advance towards the truth. There are others who can make common advance towards the truth, but who are not yet able to take with you a like firm stand. And there are others with whom you can take uh, such a firm stand, but with whom you cannot associate in judgment. Interesting. Play that one back if you like. But I think that was a good one. Um, all these different pieces. Almost as if there's a hierarchy in people's capacities to understand. Okay, book 10. Concerning the sage in his daily life. Of course, that would be Confucius is the sage. Chapter 1. Confucius in his native village bore himself with simplicity, as if he had no gifts of speech. But when in the temple or at court, he expressed himself readily and clearly, yet with a measure of reserve. So I thought that was interesting. Um, the public life of Confucius was very humble. But in the private, but in the, what did I say, or in the private life, in his his daily life, he was humble. But in the public life, in when he's in the court, in the temple, he expressed himself readily and clearly, yet with a measure of reserve. So the, the, uh, the, home, the homely uh, Confucius the, is still there, but you have someone who is more serious and more adamant about his views. He's being, he's, um, exercising his place in being in the temple of the court. And actually, I'm not sure if I have this um, highlighted in here, but one of the quotes I remember from Confucius, or one of the, um, not, I, don't, I can't qu quote him directly, but one of the things I got out of reading this was that Confucius suggested that if you were able, if you were a learned man, you must run in the government. You must be a part of of the social something. You must be a part of the church. You must be a part of, I guess, education today. You must be a part of the government. You have to, if you are at a, uh, a point where you are, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, experienced or learned or whatever you want to say, then the best use of, of that is to be put into some place where you can steer society. I don't know. But Confucius was very adamant about that. I don't know if I highlighted a, uh, a quote from there, but I guess we'll find out. But I just remember that part. I thought that was important for to get across. It's certainly Confucius was adamant about it. Okay, I'm looking for the next one. Okay, here it is. So this is book 11, chiefly concerning the disciples. This is chapter 15. To go beyond the mark, replied the master, is as bad as to come short of it. I thought that was interesting because of Aristotle's moderation. Very similar. Everything in moderation, or well, most things in moderation. Some things are right out. But most things in moderation. You don't want to be too courageous because then you're, you'll just run in there and get yourself killed. But you don't want to be too weak because then you'll just be stepped on. So you have to have a healthy amount of courage. That's one of the examples Aristotle uses. All right, I'm looking for the next one. Oh, was that one? Yes, okay, this is book 13, uh, ch uh, Chiefly Concerning Government. This is chapter 3. Um, there's a bunch of ones, but I'm on number 4 of chapter 3. How uncultivated you are, you, which is a person, Rec responded the master, a wise man, in regard to what he does not understand, maintains an attitude of reserve. In ter if terms be incorrect, then statements do not accord with facts. 
And when statements and facts do not accord, then business is not properly executed. When business is not properly executed, order and harmony do not flourish. When order and harmony do not flourish, then justice becomes arbitrary. And when justice becomes arbitrary, the people do not know how to move hand or foot. Hence, whatever a wise man states, he can always define. And what he so defines, he can always carry into practice. But the wise man will on no account have anything remiss in his definitions. Fantastic. Probably one of the best parts of this. That one right there. Play that one back. It's a good one. All right, looking for the next one. Okay, here we go. Chapter, er, yeah, chapter 15. Duke Ting inquired whether there were any one phrase by the adoption of which a country could be made prosperous. No phrase can be expected to have such a force as that, replied Confucius. But there is, a, there is the popular saying, it is hard to be a prince and not easy to be a minister. If a prince perceives the difficulty of being a prince, may he not expect through the, that one phrase to prosper his country? Is there any one phrase, he asked, through which a country may be ruined? No phrase can be expected to have such a force as that, replied Confucius. But there is the popular saying, I should have no gratification in being a prince, unless none opposed my commands. If those are good, and no one opposes them, that surely is well. But if they are not good, and no one opposes them, may he not expect in that one phrase to ruin the country? Take what you will from that. I just thought it was interesting, though. Uh, this, this duke, so this person in government, asking Confucius if there is one phrase or one not necessarily a phrase, but at least like some kind of policy or some uh, idea. One idea that would either prosper a country or ruin a country. And so this was what Confucius said.